I am sure a lot of you have seen this video by Dirty Civilian's channel and were very intrigued in getting this so-called off-grid internet. And while the product is cool, it isn't $300 cool. In fact, the price of all of the parts combined sits at about less than half that cost. So then what is this comprised of? It's a Raspberry Pi Zero 2W, a Pi Sugar 2 battery backup, a 512 GB SD card, a waterproof case, and all in, you're looking at $126. Straight up, look at this, they slapped a sticker on the Pi Sugar. Now I get that grid base are charging a convenience fee, but I feel like we can do a little bit better. Today, I will show you how to create not only an off-grid Wikipedia server, but an all-in-one solution that can download and save a plethora of media that you will need to survive and, most importantly, maintain your morale if things went south. And the whole setup uses a single script that I created. Now, I made this at about a date, and it's pretty straightforward to use, so here is a list of what it does. And I'll show you these highlights here in just one second, but first, we need some hardware. You thought it was going to be an ad, didn't you? Now, in my case, I went for a CF54 Toughbook. It is by no means impressive, even in its hardware capabilities, and in some ways is pretty underpowered compared to other newer Toughbooks out there. However, I got this on eBay for a cool 220 bucks, and at the time of recording, most of them are sitting around the sub 160 range. But the 60, the grid-based pocket is 300 dolins. Why would I want to do this all by my little lonesome? Well, on top of everything else that we're about to install, this includes a keyboard, mouse, common IO, a built-in battery, expandable disk space, and an incredibly durable case that you can take pretty much anywhere. Any little handle. Look at that little guy. Eh, pretty good. Now think about it, anywhere you go with this, you have everything you need in one place, including a desktop environment, rather than having to use another device to interface with your server to access important data. Another thing to think about when buying your hardware is that we're going to be adding in a local large language model to this device, which will be utilizing the CPU. But the 6 day GPUs are superior. I am so well aware that GPUs are infinitely faster at generating tokens than CPUs, however, we are trying to conserve a valuable resource in a poop hit the fan scenario, that being power. The wattage of a mobile GPU is generally gonna be way higher than that of a simple CPU. All I'm saying is that for me, this tough book works, but feel free to use something like a Raspberry Pi, especially the new five variant or an old laptop or a NUC. Just understand your hardware limitations are going to dictate your overall AI experience. Also, with that being said, I am not covering how to do this on a Raspberry Pi, although if you can get one up and running with something like Raspberry Pi OS, feel free to try the script out as well, but like I said, no guarantees. So now that we have your hardware or your device, we need to get an operating system on this machine. And in order to do that, we want to create an installation media for your hardware to utilize. Today, we're gonna to be using Ventoy. This is by far my favorite method of doing this as adding in ISOs is a breeze and the GUI is super intuitive. If you don't like Ventoy, you wanna do something else, by all means, Raspberry Pi Flasher is good, uh, Belena Etcher, there's a litany of them out there. Do what makes you feel happy. So back down the Ventoy train, go ahead and get it downloaded, extracted zip, insert a flash drive and then run the exe install ventoy on the flash drive again it's super point and click here then navigate to the drive and add in your iso this is actually probably the longest part of all of this so in regards to your operating system or your iso you want to get something that is based off the Debian distro. So that would be something like Ubuntu, Deepin, Peppermint OS, etc. For me, I will be using Zorin OS. It's not very resource hungry, which is important as I don't really have the specs to be running a super bloated OS. And again, you don't have to use Zorin OS. As long as it's Debian based, this script should work. And for the people with a hearing and or reading comprehension of a kumquat, there is a free version of Zorin OS that sacrifices nothing. You don't have to buy this to have a good user experience by any means. I swear, I I'm gonna see this in the comment section. Oh, 60, it's $47. Imagine paying $47 for an for an OS. Bro's really out here paying $47 for an OS. <laughs> Anyways, I'll head to the Zorin download page, demo their ISO. Then after that's done, I will place this inside my Ventoy USB. Great. Now we just need to get this on your hardware. First, plug in your Ventoy USB into your machine with it powered all the way off. Next, press the power button on your machine and begin tapping or holding your machine's BIOS button. 
In my case, it was F2. In your case, it will likely be different. Maybe something like delete or escape. But I suggest you look up your machine's specific BIOS button on Google. Now that we're in the BIOS, we want to go over to boot options. Again, my BIOS is likely going to look a lot different than yours. What we're looking to find is the boot order. So that way we can tell the BIOS to look at Ventoy first before anything else. So this is how I do it on mine. I use my arrow keys, go to boot, and then I'll change the boot order here to ensure that Ventoy is the first option that comes up. Next, ensure that you save and exit to make sure that your changes are affected. Your machine should reboot at this point and then end up at the Ventoy screen. If it didn't, look through your BIOS settings and verify everything is configured properly and try again. Otherwise, come join the Discord. I'd be more than happy to help you if you run into issues. Now, from the Ventoy screen, select the ISO you would like to install on this machine. If you've only put one on there, you'll only see the one. In my case, again, I'm using Zorin OS, so I will select that. This should bring you to an installation prompt. Yours may look different, but that's okay. Follow these prompts and fill out the information that's requested of you. Once you're done, the machine will likely reboot. At this point, take your installation media out so that your machine does not try to boot again from that. Some operating systems will prompt you to do this automatically, some won't, so just kind of feel it out there. All right, now that we're booted up into the desktop environment, we're ready to get things set up. First things first, ensure that you've updated your machine completely. To do so on most Debian-based systems, perform the command sudo apt update and and sudo apt upgrade. This will update your operating system. Once this finishes, go to the link down below to my GitHub page and download the atlas-installer.sh. If you don't like using random people's scripts on the internet, by all means, send this through VirusTotal. I did as well, came out with zero results. I, I, listen, I'm uninterested in how many cat videos you watch, nor in collecting your personal data. It means nothing to me. I don't want to do that. This is not bad. I, pr I promise. So go to where you downloaded the script and open a terminal. Ensure that you are in the same directory as the script inside your terminal. That is very important. Type ls. If you see atlas-installer.sh, you're in the right place. If you don't see that, then use the command cd to change to the directory that it exists. Now type sudo chmod plus x atlas-installer.sh. This makes the script executable. And then next type sudo dot forward slash atlas-installer.sh. This begins the install. And if you're wondering how I was able to type just the letter A and then the rest magically appeared, that's just autocomplete. Use the tab key in order to do that. Now, just sit back, relax, grab yourself a little root beer and let that run. This may take up to 20 minutes depending on your internet speed. Something that you may notice and I noticed as well whenever I was doing this is that the Olama install seems to take forever sometimes or it may hang. If that happens, hit control C and then run the install command again. That should speed things up significantly. Misty also takes a long time to install as well. So if that appears to hang on that one, just give it about five minutes or so. And bada bing, bada boom, it's ready. Now let's walk through everything we just installed. First and foremost, Kiwix. This is where our Wikipedia or Zim files are presented. Looking through our extra little directions here, a new directory was made in our documents folder called Kiwix-Zims. In that vein, let's go through how to get Wikipedia's downloaded and shown inside of Kiwix. Go to this link here provided in the description as well and find the wiki that you'd like to download. In my case, I wanted to download all of Wikipedia. Select download, then place it in the Kiwix-Zims folder inside your documents folder. Now, my recommendation is that you use a torrent client. It'll go much, much faster. Because of what torrent clients can be used for, YouTube is pretty strict uh, about that. So I'll let you use your Googling skills to find a good torrent client. Maybe one that sounds like uh, Q the bit for the rent. Once that zim file is done downloading, let's go to Kiwix, then these three dots in the top right hand corner, settings, browse, then select that same folder. Next, click on the folder in the top right hand corner and then point it at that new zim file that we just downloaded. And there you go. You have downloaded an offline copy of Wikipedia for your own perusal. Another interesting tool that I kind of saw while going through this project is something called Zimit, which turns websites into these offline Wikipedia Zim files that we can then browse at our leisure through Kiwix. That appears to use Docker, which I won't be getting into this video, but I thought it would be good to include here. Just as another asset for you, especially those 
interested or have the uh, the know-how to get that set up. And there is a website, but when I tried to use it, I personally had poor results. Now let's say you want to share this little Wikipedia with other people. Part of the install process opened up port 8080 of your machine. What this does is allow other computers on the same network as you to access that information over port 8080. But Mr. Sixth what is my IP? Go to your terminal and enter in IPA. This should show you your IP address. This is also shown when we start the Kiwix server. Go to the three dots in the top right hand corner, local Kiwix server, start Kiwix server, and open in browser. There's your IP address right there. Now, anyone on your same network can go to your machine's IP address and should be able to see everything. The other added benefit is that we can create a local hotspot for users to join. So if I go into my settings here and find this option to turn on my Wi-Fi hotspot, I can have users connect directly with my machine and be able to access Kiwix as well without the added need of an internal network. All right, moving on to our next application, we're gonna be talking about J Downloader. When you first open it, it will need to update really quick, so just keep that in mind, but this is pretty dang cool. It's a tool that you can use to download pretty much any content on the web that has a link, but more usefully, YouTube videos. Now again, I can't show you exactly how to do so, as that would be a violation of Mr. YouTube's timelines. However, However, I will say that if you wanted to download entire playlists using this tool, it can do that. The app is pretty intuitive overall, so just test it out for yourself, play around with it, and download yourself some videos that will be vital to your survival and entertainment. On to our AI. What we installed using this script is two AI tools, one called Olama, the other called Misty. Think of Olama as kind of a back-end tool. It doesn't have a pretty GUI to work in, but it's what interfaces with your local large language model or LLM. There are a plethora of models to choose from, but what I added in that install script is Quen 2.5 0.5b. This is a very small model that is useful, but can be a little bit dumb from time to time. The reason for this is due to its pretty low 0.5 billion parameters, which is essentially the data it was trained off of and uses for responding to user input. My thought process for this is that at the very least, you'll get a halfway decent LLM when you install the script that should work even on some of the most limited hardware. You can, by all means, install other models by browsing through the Olama website and find models that use higher parameters if your hardware supports it. Then all you need to do is paste in this command into a terminal and Olama will pull down and run that model. With Olama, you can interact with your LLM using just this alone but it's lacking a nice interface. Misty, on the other hand, is the pretty UI that we can use to interact with our LLM in a more human-friendly way. Now, I said before about Raspberry Pis and how some things might not work. This specifically, I highly doubt will work at all. Misty is a very demanding application, so no guarantees there. The way we use Misty is through the link that was created on your desktop, finding it in your applications, or simply by typing Misty in the terminal. Now, by default, Misty wants to download Gemma 3 1 billion model as it doesn't see our Olama model just yet. Change this to something small like Tiny Dolphin to speed up this process as we can change it once we're done setting it up. Once Tiny Dolphin or whatever you chose is done downloading, it will bring you into the program. After this, let's go to Settings, Remote Model Providers, Add Remote Model Provider, Provider, and then Olama Remote. For the name, just put Olama. For the address here, put in localhost on port 11434. Now select fetch models. Then at this point, you should see Quen 2.5 show up as it's the only one that the script installed initially. Click the check mark next to it, and then finally select add in the bottom right hand corner. Now at the bottom of your screen in the chat area, you'll likely see Tiny Dolphin as the model that you're currently using. Change this to Quen 2.5 and give it a test. A lot of the prompts you give it initially are going to be kind of slow overall, but this is a neat way to interact with your LLM and keep things organized. But the sixth day, why did we install LLM if we're using Misty? Redundancy. Misty is nice, but also the last thing you want is to have nothing to fall back on in the event it stops working. Having Olama by itself ensures that we have another option free of constraints should we need it. Now, could you do all of this on Windows? Yes, absolutely. Download, install, download, install, download, install, download, install. Legit, it is that simple. Once all that's installed, feel free to just configure it basically the same way we did it on the Linux side of things. 
So there you go, an all-in-one information center that can provide critical knowledge in a compact form factor that costs less than a grid-based pocket. Just remember, this script I made simply automates the installation of these applications. It really isn't doing anything magical. If you want to install all of these things manually, be my guest. I just wanted to offer the community a lower barrier to entry in this realm. Now I can just hear it in the comments now about spending all this time setting things up essentially equates out to the $300 of grid base costs. Except it doesn't. It's, it's, it doesn't. Instead of a pocket device that doesn't have any great way to add more information and requires another device to even access, you now have an all-in-one tool that you can add more information as you go and I provide you a script to get this going in less than maybe like 30 minutes at max. Additionally, if you want to keep a low signature, broadcasting where you are at all times with what is essentially a wireless beacon uh, may not be the smartest choice. In this case, we can turn on airplane mode and keep a lower profile or on the tough book, even disable the network adapters completely via the hardware and air gapped machine, all the while still being able to access critical data. And notice how I said lower profile and not zero. Again, I'm trying to predict all the YouTube comments here, but it's, it's, I, I, just, oh, I cannot wait. Can't wait. So if you don't like this, don't make it. If you'd rather spend 300 bucks on something that is overpriced by at least 160 bucks, go for it. But I prefer to set things the way I see fit with information that I can control on a platform I am comfortable with and can make modifications to at any time. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them down below and I'd be more than happy to help in any way that I can. Anyways, thank you all so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And as always, remember our sole objectives. Stop the killing. Stop the dying. I'll see y'all later.